Isaiah chapter 1. As I said when we had discussed this Bible study, Isaiah has 66 chapters. So we're probably going to be a while in Isaiah, probably better, easily better than a year. Isaiah chapter 1. We divide the prophetic books of the Old Testament into major prophets and minor prophets. Uh, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And there are 12 minor prophets. And these divisions have nothing to do with the importance of the prophecies. They're simply a reference to the length of the books. Of the four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel were more or less contemporaries. Jeremiah prophesied during the period leading up to the final destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by Nebuchadnezzar, while Daniel and Ezekiel were taken to Babylon during the first and second resettlements from Judah to Babylon. Isaiah is uh, two or three generations before them. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Isaiah's name means the Lord shall save. He lived from about 760 BC to about 680 BC. He was born during the reign of King Uzziah of Judah and lived into the reign of King Manasseh, probably being about 80 years old when he died. This place is Isaiah about midway, a little bit beyond midway between the time of King David and the Babylonian captivity. By verse 1, we know Isaiah was the son of Amos, not to be confused with the prophet Amos. It is thought that Amos, Isaiah's father, was the brother of King Amaziah of Judah, who was Uzziah's father. It is also believed that Amos himself was a prophet. So it appears Isaiah was of the royal house of David and a cousin to these kings under whom he prophesied. While we do not know for certain, it is thought Isaiah was martyred by being sawn in two on the order of King Manasseh, who was Hezekiah's son. So Isaiah actually lived through the reign of five different kings. And of these five kings, three were considered righteous and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uzziah, Jotham, and Hezekiah. Both Ahaz and Manasseh, not so much. The record of Isaiah's prophesying ended sometime during the reign of King Hezekiah. But I do not believe it is a stretch to conclude that it was Isaiah's opposition to Manasseh's sinful and idolatrous ways that eventually led to his martyrdom. Isaiah does not waste any time in putting forth his message. His first prophetic utterance begins with verse 2. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up but they have rebelled against me. The Lord God is about to hold court and pass judgment over his people Israel, specifically over, as Isaiah said in verse 1, Judah and Jerusalem. From the time of Moses, God had been calling his people, the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to receive the Lord's promise to Abraham and to honor the Lord God and no one else. They received the law and became a covenant people under Moses. They demanded an earthly king to rule over them during the time of Samuel. The Lord anointed Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, but the kingship was stripped from Saul due to his disobedience. The Lord raised up David, son of Jesse. And due to David's devotion to his Lord, God promised David that one of his descendants would sit on Israel's throne for eternity. But when Solomon came to the throne, even though he started strong in the Lord, he was enticed away into idolatry and paganism. The Lord declared to Solomon that because of his falling away, the kingdom would be taken away from his descendants. 
but because of the Lord's promise to David. One of David's descendants would still sit on the throne in Jerusalem. Upon Solomon's death, the kingdom split. Ten tribes separated from Judah and Benjamin to form their own nation. There followed a succession of kings in both the northern and southern kingdoms. Of the northern kings, not one was righteous and walked in the ways of David in righteousness before the Lord. Of the southern kings, only about half followed after David in righteousness. Since the time of Solomon, there has been a steady decline among all the children of Israel, both in the northern and southern kingdoms. And as we see in these opening chapters of the book of Isaiah, God has had enough. And as we see in these opening verses of chapter 1, God is bringing an indictment against his people for their rebellion against him. And he is calling all of creation as witnesses against his people. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth. For the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. And turned their backs on him. The task that had been laid out before Israel was to be a beacon of light, of God's holiness, and of God's blessings. They were to be what Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount, the light of the world and the salt of the earth. There were clearly times when the power of God was revealed through his people. There were times when the blessings of God were showered upon his people. And there was a time when his people, because of their devotion to God, were the envy of the world. During the times of David and especially Solomon, Jerusalem was the religious and cultural and educational center of the known world. But they lost sight of God and began a downward spiral. Continuing in verse 5. Why should you be beaten any more? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured and your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. In the times since David and Solomon, when Israel was one of the most powerful nations in the region, there has been a steady decline of the people. Surrounding kings have been slowly eroding both the northern and southern kingdoms. The kings of both Israel in the north and Judah in the south have at times been forced to become vassals of more powerful kingdoms. The Lord asks his people in verse 5, Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? In essence, asking, Why have you let yourselves fall from the heights you once knew by your abandonment of the Lord God? Continuing in verse 8, the daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Zion is the mountain on which Jerusalem sits. The daughter of Zion is most likely a reference to the city itself. The reference here to a shelter in a vineyard or a hut in a cucumber field was to the practice of putting a small tent or hut near or in a vineyard or field to shield the person tasked with watching the crops grow through the harvest season. Once the harvest was done, the shelter or hut would be abandoned until the beginning of the next season. 
Verse 9, unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. This, of course, is referring to the remnant. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors. The survivors being that remnant, those within Judah and Jerusalem who were still seeking the Lord's righteousness, who were still devoted to the Lord their God. If you remember, after Elijah had challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, when he received word that Jezebel had put a price on his head, he fled the northern kingdom. Elijah prayed that the Lord would take him, because he was the only one left in Israel who still worshipped the Lord. But the Lord told Elijah, that there were still 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed a knee to Baal. Unfortunately, those who remained faithful to the Lord God seem to almost always be much smaller than those who simply pay lip service to God. It is those pretenders the Lord is calling the rulers of Sodom and the people of Gomorrah. It is to those pretenders the Lord now speaks. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Can you imagine a more chilling indictment against those who only ever make a show of worshiping and serving God? This goes back to what God said to King Saul through the prophet Samuel at the time of his second great act of rebellion against God. This is from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. But Samuel replied, speaking to King Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. What was said to the individual, King Saul, by the prophet Samuel, is now being spoken generally to the inhabitants, everyone, in Judah and Jerusalem, by the prophet Isaiah. But even though God is delivering this indictment against his people, he is still willing to offer his hand of redemption to those who will take it. Verse 16. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Even at their worst place of disobedience and rebellion against him, God is offering his path of redemption to any who will seek it. Verse 21, See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She was once full of justice, 
Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, Ah! I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. But rebels and sinners will both be broken. Those who forsake the Lord will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tender and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. Verse 21, see how the faithful city, that is Jerusalem, has become a prostitute. Jerusalem, during the time of David and Solomon, had been a city full of justice and righteousness. But in the 200 years since Solomon's time, or at least his descent into idolatry and paganism, the influence of worldliness had slowly replaced the godliness that had previously characterized Jerusalem. This is in part what Jesus was talking about when he warned his disciples to beware the leaven of the Pharisees. A little bit of error, a little bit of compromise, a little bit of worldliness that creeps in, if not excised, will eventually supplant the holiness, righteousness, and godliness that once characterized a people or even a city. The Lord says in verse 25, I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. The Lord is promising that those who oppose him will be removed. And verse 26, I will restore your leaders as in days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. The Lord promises that he will have a people who will honor him, starting with leaders who are devoted to him. But understand, God will not force righteousness on anyone, but rather he will lift up the righteous, those of the remnant who have remained faithful and devoted to the Lord God, and those who have seen their sins and repented of those sins and sought to walk after the Lord in righteousness. As the Lord spoke to those who would call themselves his people, then so he speaks to us today. Our worship, our service, our sacrifice, our offerings, all these are meaningless before God without our obedience. Truly, to obey is better than sacrifice. Any questions? Thank you into chapter two next week.